Got another video about functions here. This one's about inverses and pre-images. So if you've got a function f whose domain is a, whose codomain is b, and let's assume that f is a bijective function for now. Uh, what are some things that we know from like college algebra? Uh, we know that there exists a unique function and it's blue thing, f with this, looks like a minus one as an exponent. Remember we call that f inverse. And uh, notice the domain of f inverse, I'm just gonna go ahead and call it that, is b and the codomain is a. So it, flip, it flips around. And so how is this blue function defined? Well, we'll say that uh, f inverse of b is equal to a. Um, and remember this symbol means if and only if, so in other words, it's equivalent to b is equal to f of a. So what are we doing? We're kind of switching the inputs of what uh, switching the inputs and the outputs, how they behave. All right, so we'll call that blue function surprise the inverse of f. So when you've got a bijection, there's a special function that's related to it that's also a bijection. And if your function's name is f, then its special friend here is named f inverse. What are some important properties that I think that you know? When you compose a function with its inverse, it should spit back the input uh, for uh, any input in the domain of you know, the first function you're plugging into. So in my case, for all a and a, and now when I switch that composition, I'm plugging in b into f inverse first, so this should work out for all my b's that are in capital B. To try to give you a picture, right, I'm just trying to say, you know, a function and its inverse kind of undo each other in some way. It's kind of an informal way to say that. And I think I got a picture for you. Here's a, here's b, there's little a, there's little b, and uh, let's maybe just look at the first one. This first one up here, f inverse of f of a, why should it be a? So like how does function composition work? Remember you start inside. So we're gonna plug little a into f, and so that should spit out b. And then now what we're gonna do is plug the results into f inverse. Well, if I take b and plug it into f inverse, the definition takes me back to a. So again, you see that we kind of go in a circle there. We wind up right back at a. And you could do a similar kind of picture where you start with the blue and then end with the red, and that's the bottom line here. Okay, so again, they undo each other. And just to give you an example for like, you know, how do we find the inverse, say, so if I've got this function that uh, takes a real number and it cubes it, uh, what do we know? We know that's a bijection. I think we talked about that one in a previous video. And so what do we know then? Well, a bijection should have an inverse function. So how do we find what f inverse looks like and we'll just use the definition from above. I know that f inverse of b is equal to a, if and only if b is equal to f of a, and this latter part here gives me something to work with. I know what f should do to a, f should cube it. And so that says that b equals a cubed, and now we can use some algebra, say, to take the cube root of both sides. Since I'm working with real numbers, I know that's legit, and I know that the cube root is unique, so a cube root of b is exactly what a is. So what have I got? I know what f inverse should do. We're saying that f inverse should just take the cube root of what you plug into it. So the formula for f inverse, of course, is f inverse should just be the cube root of x, if we're using x as the variable. So that's the inverse of x cubed. Surprise. All right, so just one thing, not necessarily for like uh, an intro to proofs kind of class, if you're watching this video for those purposes, but say in topology, you'll see uh, such a thing, and also in like an abstract algebra class. So in this class and others, you're gonna study properties of functions, and some, some properties you'll look at are like continuity, or maybe differentiability, or like algebra context, homomorphisms, stuff like that. So if you've got a bijection f, and f has this property p, where property p is maybe continuity or homomorphism, you can't just assume that the inverse also has that property. So you can't assume that f and f inverse are like totally alike and that they share all these properties. So be very careful. For some properties p, sure, f and f inverse both have it. But what you'll see in some of your math classes are that there are some properties that maybe f has, but f inverse doesn't. So just be wary of that. That's an assumption. It seems intuitive, like it should happen, like they should both have that property p, but I'm telling you that that's not something that you can generally assume would need proof. Let's move on to the pre-image. So what's kind of the setup? What are we talking about here? If you're given a function f whose domain is a and whose codomain is b, and let's say you got some subset b prime of the codomain, all right? So like you got some y values if you like thinking about college algebra. Can we describe the elements of the domain that land in b prime? When I say land in b prime, I mean, what is the stuff in the domain that f sends to b prime? So I got a picture here, there's my kind of setup with my blobs I like, and what I wanna know is, you know, what's going on back here that gets sent to the yellow? So let me give you an example. If I've got 
Uh, my favorite college algebra function, f of x is x squared from the reals to the reals. Let's take uh, b prime to be the interval from zero to one. And remember, I'm considering zero, one as an interval uh, that's a subset of the codomain, right? So I'm thinking about those as y values if you wanna think of it that way. And what I wanna know is what are the real numbers in the domain that land in this interval uh, from zero to one? So maybe that should be yellow. And so there's a picture there. So I've got zero, one as my interval and that's in the codomain and I wanna look back in the domain and ask, well, what numbers get sent there? What numbers do I square and they land there? And so, well, let's kind of talk through that, you know? When we say it that way, what numbers do I square that'll land in the yellow? That gives us a foothold to start doing some algebra to. So x squared is an element of the interval from zero to one. That's true if and only if the square of x is less than or equal to one. And if I take the square root of both sides, say, that's the same thing as saying that the absolute value of x has to be less than or equal to one. And I know that I could rearrange that absolute value inequality, it's equivalent to this compound inequality, that x is between negative one and one. So what did we just show? We just showed that x should be an element of the interval from minus one to one. And so what we could do then is we could say, I could put that over here, as long as I'm in this interval, then it's guaranteed to get sent to the yellow one. All right, cool. And so I think I wrote that down here. We're gonna call that interval of the domain, right? Minus one to one is an interval of the domain. We'll call that the pre-image of the yellow interval from zero to one. So we just found this interval back here in the domain from minus one to one. I should put those there maybe. Uh, and we'll call that the pre-image of zero to one. So that idea, maybe notice, right? We're kind of looking backwards, right? So, okay, you've got this subset of the codomain. Tell me about the, look backwards and tell me about the subset of the domain that corresponds to that. That's the idea, and that's what we're gonna to try to write a definition down for. If you're given a function f from a to b, notice I'm not saying f has any properties like being bijective, and that's important because there's some notation that's gonna make you feel a bit icky in a minute. So you've got a function from a to b, and you've got a subset b prime of the codomain b. We'll say that there, we'll define the pre-image, another word for that is inverse image of b prime. It's the following subset of a. So the inverse image or pre-image use those synonymously, but it's always referring to a subset of the domain. So the notation for it, here's where you might feel icky. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You didn't say F was bijective. Why are you using that notation there? Just relax, just deal with it for a minute. Let me say what it is. F inverse of B prime is the following set. It's all the things that are in your domain A whose output lands in B prime. There's a picture over here. So again, if you're given the setup with A, B, and B prime, again, what we're asking is look backwards, what's the stuff that's in A that gets sent to B prime? And we'll call this collection of stuff uh, the pre-image of B prime. If you wanna call it F inverse of B prime, go for it. So why are we using this notation? I'm not saying that F has to have an inverse, but nonetheless, this notation still has to make sense. So the purpose for that, we still use this sort of inverse notation, even if F doesn't really have an inverse, why do we do that? Because you wanna think about, you're starting in the codomain, you're looking backwards to the domain, and that's kind of the behavior that the inverse function captures. And I think that's the, that's the intuition for why we keep this notation. You know, you're starting with your y values, that f inverse there tells you to, oh, look at what corresponds to those y values. So let's do some concrete examples. Hopefully me talking about that, just because you see this here, that doesn't mean that f inverse is really a function. It doesn't mean f inverse actually exists. This is trying to tell you to look at what are the inputs uh, whose outputs land in B prime. So let's do some concrete examples. Let's go back to uh, my function from the reals to the reals that squares your number. I've tried to color code things so that you see where my numbers live. So x is an element of you know, the blue real numbers, if you like. And what did we do earlier? Well, we've already shown that the pre-image of the interval from zero to one, and I've tried to color it so that that's a member of the codomain, that's a subset of the codomain. The pre-image of the interval from zero to one was my blue interval from minus one to one. Let's do a couple more examples using the same function here, but maybe some different yellow sets. So what would be the pre-image of the interval from minus three to minus one would be the empty set. So how come? So maybe how we'll, we'll logic through that is, well, there's no real number x such that when you square it, it lands in the interval from minus three to minus one. And what I'll try to do also to the side is draw you a picture about why that should be true. If you're looking at the graph of y equals x squared, you don't get, you don't have any y values uh, that are in minus three to minus one. So there's no x values that could correspond to such a y value either. 
cool. So there's no x values whose square again gets sent to that interval, right? The graph's always above y equals zero. All right, another one. F inverse of the singleton four. Remember when you see squigglies, that means that that's a set with one element, four. So the pre-image of four should just be the set negative two and two. So the set with those two elements. So how come, let's talk through it for a minute. What are we trying to do? Well, what would this be? You're looking at, well, what's the stuff that when I square it, because that's what my function does, it spits out four, and that just gives us a little equation to solve in this example. You get x is negative two or two. And so that is the pre-image of four. And of course, in a picture here, you know, if you've got the graph at hand, which is kind of nice in like a college algebra setting, of course, we want to take these concepts and, you know, apply these to functions where maybe the graph is not helpful at all because I can't visualize it or it doesn't make any damn sense. Um, but in this case, just to kind of drive home the point, of course, the point is this thing is an element of the codomain and we're looking backwards to see, well, I know that I have these two inputs whose output is four. So again, that's kind of the setup or or in general, what we're looking for um, whenever we're trying to find the pre-image. So what are some properties of the pre-image and image? Like how do they behave with each other? What are some general things that you can expect? So if I've got a function from A to B, I've got A prime is a subset of the domain A. I've got B prime is a subset of the codomain B. The pre-image of the empty set is always the empty set. The pre-image of the whole codomain should be the domain A. So you can always take those two things for granted. Now, how do we relate like the pre-image to like whether f actually has an inverse? Um, so f is bijective, in other words, f has an inverse. If and only if, for each element of the codomain, you could find a unique element of the domain such that the pre-image of that element b is equal to the set with just a in it. So that's maybe a formal way to make the connection about how am I using this pre-image symbol to connect with the fact that f truly has an inverse function here. All right, so the last two are always a little bit tricky. How do like the image of a set and the pre-image of a set interact? And in general, I'm gonna tell you two things here. I'll try to zoom in a little bit. So A prime is always gonna be a subset of the pre-image of the image of A prime. A little bit hard to say, but I've drawn you a picture over there to the side. So don't worry about the equality for a moment here. So A prime is a subset of A. And what we're looking at is if you take the image of a prime and then look backwards again, in general, you're gonna get more stuff perhaps than what was just in a prime. When do you get exactly what was in a prime? You get exactly a prime. In other words, there is no perhaps stuff out in this region. There's none of that stuff if F's injective. But in general, we can only say that a prime is a subset of the pre-image of the image of a prime. And then kind of going the other way, what if I switch these around? So if I've got a subset B prime of the codomain, what if I took the pre-image of that and then took the image of that? So in other words, what if I start with B prime, I'm gonna look backwards and take its pre-image, and then I'm gonna send that through F and look at the image of that. In general, B prime is gonna be a little bit more than that convoluted uh, sending things through that function. So in general, B prime is going to contain the image of the pre-image of B prime. And when do we get an equality in this case? In other words, when is there not perhaps these elements that live in this in-between area here? Those blue, that blue and that yellow set are the exact same thing exactly when f is a surjective function. So I think these two things, just proving these uh, subset relationships, those would be excellent things to try to prove on your own to get used to, um, you know, working with the set notation and kind of chasing some elements around. Excellent practice for subset proofs.